What is up, everyone? Thank you for joining this episode. My name is Anthony, and on this one, we have a dear friend of mine, Joe Lorenzo. And I'm smiling because I truly admire this man. I cherish him, and I cherish this conversation. So when I knew since high school, he has been in the startups since startups were first a thing that came into my mind. You know, he has been the lemonade stand type person. His grandfather started a company called the Lorenzo Food Group when he immigrated over to America that is now Joe's father runs and operates, which focuses on catering and distribution of food. And Joe is just getting his rounds in the ring within entrepreneurship and startups as, like I said in high school, started a coding educational company, has built some others, but now is focusing on New Men Co. And New Men Co. is a comb for your beard if you have one and you'll see it on joe today but thank you so much for joining this episode this is a great friend of mine and i know you'll get some value out of it as joe is a true 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 salesman and entrepreneur enjoy i have a dream that's one small step for man i am the greatest you want something Go get it. Period. So for context, everyone, uh, this is Joe Lorenzo. Thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. And Joe and I go way back, whereas in high school at St. Joe's, I first met him, got to know him, but also saw his uh, integration into entrepreneurship. But as we'll talk about, as we'll discuss, it derives from stuff earlier. within your deeper roots of everything. And then we'll make our way and we'll start there and make our way into the more modern present day stuff. We did with tech roots, which I was an employee and a part of that, which you led uh, super fun. And then we have a new men's co now, but I would love to hear how you entered that game. I know the Lorenzo food group is uh, your family owned company, but even before then, and you can sort of take us down and guide us, down your journey thus far and then we'll get into it more so absolutely yeah so i mean like just from the top i mean i've been trying to you know sell different things since i was young doing you know just starting from lemonade stands and, and different things like that um but my grandfather started his company uh, in 1969 um and he grew that it's just a meat and cheese distribution company uh if anybody if anyone knows in our area in new jersey thumans is a big like deli meat company out there um, and he started, he was like one of their biggest distributors of meat and, meats and cheeses in the 60s and 70s. Um, so he kind of grew that. And then from then on, my dad and my uncle took over that. And that kind of, I guess, put something in me of that entrepreneurial spirit that my grandfather started something. And then my, my dad took that and even like iterated on it and, and made it even bigger than it he could ever think of. Um, and from that, I've always been like trying to sell stuff with my friends back in school I, I remember like the first thing I like actually made and sold was um, you remember back when we were like, I think we were 12 or 13, the I heart boobs bracelets for like breast cancer and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. So they were like catching fire. I think when we were like sixth grade and uh, we were like, Hey, we're, where's, all, where's all, where's all the love to, uh, to the male side. So like we started to make our own bracelets, I heart balls. And it was for <laughs> testicular cancer, you yeah, know, yeah. testicular cancer. <laughs> and uh, we started selling that. I was like 11 years old. We found a place to make it online. Um, and that was like the first thing I actually, we actually like thought of and started selling. Um, and then from then on, we, I kind of just like fell in love with it. Me and my friend that we, we still, we've been starting businesses together apparently since we were 11 years old, actually. <laughs> um, we, we just fell in love with it. And we just continued to do it. Um, so from that, and then we moved on to in school, we started selling candy uh, to get like me and him and my other friend, uh, Kyle, who, who does his own entrepreneurial stuff right now as well. But uh, we started selling candy just to everybody in our school in eighth grade. It, it caught fire. We got in trouble with the principals a lot because technically we need like a vendor's license and all that, like jargon and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, but we started doing that. And then from then, then there was a little bit of a hiatus when I went to St. Joe's. Um, there was still, I was always working at my family business. I was learning from my dad, from my uncle. Um, and then my friend brought me this opportunity that he thought of, of teaching uh, coding to kids. Um, as you know, and, and Anthony worked for us. He, um, we taught computer programming to kids. It was called Tech Roots Academy. And uh, he thought of the idea because he was fascinated with 
you know, computer programming, but he never had a place to learn. Um, so we're, so he like thought like, Hey, let me try and teach myself a little bit. And then I'll go teach other kids around like third grade to seventh grade level. And, uh, that's, that's how he started, but he, it got very overwhelming for him uh, in the beginning because he didn't know what to do. Not that I had any expertise in the, in the matter, but he, he thought of me and he was like, Hey, do you want to come join with this? And he, he was one of my best friends, still is my best friend. Um, and from then on, that's, that's when we really started. Yeah. It's nice that you had such a close friend to start businesses with. I feel like it's very hard to do, especially since you were 11. Yeah. I mean, me and him, I've known him since fourth grade and he's actually in my friend group. He's still considered the new kid. Me and all my friends have been friends since kindergarten. Like we've known each other forever. So like my friend group of people back home, uh, he's still like one of the new kids on the block because he came a few years after everybody. So, but he's still like one of my oldest friends. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been, all of us have just been, had such a close relationship and then me and him kind of branched off to do our own thing entrepreneurial wise uh, and start that business. And then since then we've started two or three companies um, yeah. that have all came and went. Yeah. And then for, as you know, within entrepreneurship and business, the sales is the foundation so what were some bigger things you learned from your grandfather and your dad when you were maybe like the next man in line to take over the business? Obviously, that might not be a thing. Maybe it's an aspiration. But nonetheless, since they have so much experience, what were the main things, especially off the jump, that really sat deep within your uh, sales DNA that you started to form? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that my grandfather taught me and my dad as well is kind of like, nobody's going to do it for you. Like, even if you have a partner, um, especially yeah. in sales, it's not just going to happen. You have to kind of go out and get each sale, whether you find the medium that works to, you know, explode, or you have to literally go door by door and just sell what you got to sell. Um, and I think my grandfather, from the start of when he started his business, he, that was his whole thing. And then he just continuously did that. And then eventually it caught fire. Um, and then I kind of like took that when we started Tech Roots, I was literally going library to library, school to school to sell this program to, uh, you know, the librarians or the teachers to actually teach these kids. Um, and they didn't even know what to say to me half the time. They're like, you're a 17 year old kid. What are you doing here? And I'm like, listen, I, I have a coding program. I want to teach in your school. And then they would, you know get on board or they say like, we're not interested, you know, of course you, you get the, the rejections all, all the time. But um, that's definitely, I think the biggest thing was just like, don't wait for it to happen with sales. Mm -hmm. Don't create, don't focus so much on like the product, the service, whatever it is, validate it, get out there and make sure people actually want it. Just go door to door and like hustle and, mm -hmm. and kind of figure it out that way. And with new men's co loved for you to preface with what exactly it is but can you talk about within that niche of making a product because before tech roots is more service-based obviously mm -hmm. you have products with your online sure. courses and programs but now that it's product-based with this um what were the initial steps you took to validate it but then do the research and then kind of walk us through the phase and the process of how you're building out the MVP for it. For sure. Yeah. So uh, for everybody who wants to know, Newman is a men's grooming company. Uh, we're sticking right now to the beard care space. So right now our best selling product is a beard straightener. Um, it's kind of like a new, like trendy type of product um, for anybody who has a long beard. Um, they can kind of groom it out. If they got curly beard, they'll make it a little longer. So did, on, did, um, you, did you have your beard beforehand or you grow it out because you started this company? I've, I've grown it out now because I started this company. Yeah. Like, well, I, I always had a beard. Yeah. I, I always had a beard, but like def definitely never this long. So I, I want to be our brand image. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so like to form that MVP of our beard straightener, which is our main product, um, we did what was called drop shipping. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, any drop shipping. So there were products out there that were similar to what we have. Not exactly because like we developed it, but um, there were similar products that we just, you know, made a e-commerce store on Shopify, just kind of got it out there, see if people would be willing to buy it. Um, and we kind of just tested it that way with Facebook ads for about, I want to say like two months um, to really see like what, what's the way we can scale it, what's the way we can actually get to market quick and all that stuff. Um, and while we were doing that and testing it, we were then developing our product um, 
the product we're actually selling right now with our manufacturer in, in China. So we kind of validated it with the sales of the drop shipping business. And then now we're actually like inventory on hand um, going full force with it. Oh, so the product you were using for the drop shipping stuff, was it just like a rough draft of the, pr- the product you have now or what was it? Yeah, it was, it was kind of just like a off the shelf kind of version of it. Like these manufacturers made it. It's really, it was a really, really not a great product. Um, so we definitely iterated on it and made it like yeah. 10 times better. But um, it was kind of just like to validate people actually wanted this um, and would pay for it. I see. Okay. And then now it's at the point where you're, you're still iterating a little bit, but you almost have like a falling right. product. And what are your current focuses in terms of, cause it's like product is one side, marketing is the next in distribution. Like where are you at marketing and distribution wise to scale it out and, and grow the brand and the product? Yeah. So we've been actually like marketing this through Facebook and Instagram ads since I want to say June. Uh, we started with our like product is done. We're still like, we're going to come out with a 2.0 eventually. And we're, we're still working on, you know, doing some research and development on that. But our main focus is just on acquiring customers. Um, so to date, we've probably done about like 400 K in revenue um, from June till now um, with about like, I want to say like 10,000 customers or so. So it's really good. we, um, yeah, so we like now we're kind of focusing and switching to the customer retention side. Now it's been this is month five of us doing it. We want to switch our focus, not just still focus on acquisition, but more sort of the retention side since we have so many customers now. Let's see if we can get them coming back. Um, yeah. So that's our been our main focus these these past like maybe like a few weeks. We switched that. That's awesome. That's really good initial traction. And are you yeah. uh, more so like because I know email. Uh, campaigns and stuff and marketing can be more sticky. Are you going down that route or what are you thinking? Yeah. We, so we actually just started, I want to say in this past month, um, probably from like mid September, we just started like really going all out with our email marketing uh, because we have so many customers and like, you know, people that have, you know, abandoned checkout or whatever. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of customer data that we can work with. Um, we've been seeing some success, you know, it's a lot of hit or miss with email marketing, uh, but we're slowly learning uh, what, what, the right thing to do and what the wrong things to do are so that's like been definitely a learning curve um with facebook it's a little bit more of like you either know it's working or it's not working we've seen like with email it's kind of like some days it'll work some days it won't work it, it just kind of depends gotcha and is this all new stuff you've learned or did you have to is it yeah new stuff you learned that you had to kind of develop on the go or did you know how to do some of this beforehand? Cause I know a lot of entrepreneurship is kind of figuring it as you go. Yeah. So, so what was that? So like the phase of like your learning and like your, your sort of conscious competence is where you're at with stuff. But right. we've done that. Yeah. So like I would say uh, with Facebook ads in regards to Facebook ads, I have done it since I want to say for like two years now uh, with running different drop shipping type stores and just kind of making some, some money on the side. Um, and this is the only time I've actually ran it for like a full, like we have inventory on hand for like months. And so that's like a learning as you go kind of thing. I was very good at, and even my friends who I've uh, started businesses with as well, we we're all very good at scaling quickly with Facebook ads, spending a lot of money, making sure that that brings in revenue uh, and profit. But we'd never really got past the maybe second or third month uh, of these stores. It was always just like quick cash, get in, get out. Now we're trying trying to actually learn long-term Facebook advertising, which is, is a much different beast that we've, uh, we, we still haven't yet figured out. We're learning as we go. Um, so it's yeah. like a lot of trial and error with that. It's a lot of just testing different things. Hey, that worked, that didn't work. Like, oh, we just wasted a lot of money um, and all that stuff. Uh, and with email marketing, it's literally all brand new to me. Like I never did any email marketing. So me and my partner are working uh, vigorously, like trying to figure that out because like we have so much data and we want to like put it to good use. Got it. Got it. And are you, cause that's the constant thing. It's like, uh, you only step up because you kind of go down in a way. So right. you're constantly failing, but even though that's a, a course of learning in and of itself, what are other places you're going to resource wise or people you're learning from to develop more knowledge within these specific categories? Cause I think it's cool if people can, 
uh, who are listening can go to those same spots or maybe just take something away in their own. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of things that we've actually like taken away, I don't know We're so we're a D2C company, direct consumer. Um, and a lot of people on Twitter actually have been having a lot of issues and different things with Facebook uh, this past month, because I don't know if uh, you're aware, but like iOS 14 with the iPhone, they made a new update that Facebook can't track as much as they used to. So that's been oh. screwing up a lot of companies data with like tracking you know, different purchases and add to carts and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of that has been screwing up what we've done in the past. Now we kind of have to relearn a new way. Um, a lot of people are figuring that out. So I would say like a lot of people are open. A lot of founders are open on Twitter um, about different things and different practices that they do. Um, and we've been learning a lot from them. We've been, we've DM them and, and different people like that um, to see like kind of their side of things. Um, but really the, the, main thing my one my one good friend Kyle he's uh, all he does is drop ship all day long his full time career um, mm-hmm. he just makes like good clean stores very quickly scales them up makes a lot of money and then closes them and then that's it um, so that's his whole business model is just like get in get out make as much money as possible quickly so he's he helped us a lot in the beginning um, with actually scaling quickly um, and now from him we've learned from his one friend who's been doing similar type of stuff as us, uh, D to C that he's been teaching us a lot as well. So I don't know if you can really get that resource from him, but I would say if anybody's listening, Twitter is a huge space. If you're uh, an entrepreneur to learn a lot of stuff from different founders and 99% of the time, in my experience, if you reach out to a founder, they're going to respond to you because they've been in the same boat as you. And they're like, yeah, very willing to help. Yeah. If you do it from a genuine place, good intent yeah. for sure. The one company that, uh, well, two actually, the first one I thought of when you were talking was Dollar Shave Club and just mm. yeah, amazing job, like co- sort of a case study on getting an email base and then mm-hmm. using that for customer retention. And then their one yeah. campaign is just the crushed. Um, yeah. And actually we had on a guy a couple episodes ago who uh, ran user acquisition or something with marketing campaigns for Dollar Shave Club. Wow. We talked about how, and I'll, I can even connect you guys. Um, Please, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. But I think uh, he helped with like that, that initial campaign and he talked about how essential the emails were in getting recurring people. Um, mm-hmm. But then the second brand I thought of, because you mentioned Twitter, was Fast. Do you know about them? <laughs> yeah, I know about Fast. <laughs> I know Fast very well. The guy <laughs> raised, uh, I think he raised like $20 million. Um, he's like, yeah, he's, he's unbelievable. My, uh, I only know about him. My, my partner is like in that world of Silicon Valley, like raising money. Um, so he like, he, he put me onto him, but yeah, he's, he's crazy. That guy. Yeah. yeah the, I completely agree with you with Twitter. It only was until quarantine basically recently in 2020 where I started using Twitter more. Not mm-hmm. only did I vibed with just writing. I like writing instead of like visuals, even though I do video and, and mm-hmm. storytelling in that regard, like visually Twitter is just this different, uh, medium and approach and I not only learn a lot from them and from people on there but it's it's amazing how that app is free because people just give so much good advice and you're so watching college yeah like even fast they most of their stuff was through Twitter and like their building in public was through Twitter. yeah yeah so it, it's crazy I mean like definitely so like we're with Shopify right now if they integrate with Shopify like we'll definitely get on that because it's just it's ingenious. I mean, like, why would you, if, if your customer can have a better experience that way, like, why not? Every time they come, they could just one click purchase from you. That's like a no brainer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And for you, so what would be the main sort of hurdles you're approaching now? Cause I know you mentioned some that you're learning and then how are you approaching them? Cause I think for you, you've been through your fair share of like having to learn as you go. And yeah. I think a lot of people can see that as like a uh, hindrance to their growth, but it's, it's part of the way, like you need to do that. Sure. So what, how are you like approaching these different hurdles as you run your own race? Yeah. So like one thing that's like, I mean, I guess a little different than some of, of some other people in our space is we didn't, uh, we raised no money. So we have zero funding. This is just me and my partner have been doing different businesses together for a while. So we've built up, uh, you know, enough cash to, to get going here, but we're starting to run into the, we're growing faster than we thought. And 
it's taking more money than we thought. Uh, so like we're t having to shell out a lot of money for inventory, which means we might not be able to put out enough money into advertising as we want to, which means we'll have to pivot and figure out some different things that way. Um, and that also raises the question of, should we raise money? Is it worth it to give up any equity in our company? Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, that's probably the biggest hurdle right now is kind of like managing every like money in that aspect because it's, it gets tight at some points and other points you're like, we're feeling really good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of just like, space. yeah. Cause there's a lot of yeah. oven inventory. Yeah, exactly. So it, a lot of money gets tied up in inventory because you know, you want to keep your customers happy. You don't want to have them back ordered. Um, and at the same time, it's, you kind of have to leverage different credit cards and stuff like that to make sure that you can actually keep acquiring customers. Um, so I think that's the biggest hurdle we're looking at right now is kind of, should we raise, should we not raise? Can we continue at this rate? Like in that sense? Yeah. I, that's a good problem to have. They're yeah. Fast. So yeah, we brought up like pre hitting the record button, how you want to do different pitches. Um, since it's your first time raising money or like giving up equity to, to grow, what are you both learning? And then like, how are you pitching? Because a lot of my close friends or people we've interviewed, mm -hmm. the aspect of pitching and presenting is always the like biggest thing. And you talk about iterating products, like iterating a pitch is, is even more important. So yeah. where are you at? And I know it's a loaded question, but where are you at in the realm of raising money? Um, because you need to do that in order to grow, to solve this problem. And then like, what are you learning from presenting in and of itself? I think I lost it for a second. I, I heard you though. Um, I would say the, the biggest thing like pitching wise is, uh, I mean, me and my, me and my partner are very genuine people in that sense. Um, so we don't like to add too much fluff, uh, when we're pitching and stuff like that. And a lot of VCs and a lot of people that raise money, they want that fluff. They want you to tell you like what you have is better than it is. They want you to tell you it's going to, you know, save the world and do all this stuff. Yeah. And we're just not that type of person. It's like, this is what we have this is what we've done. Like you're either with us or you're not type of thing. And I think uh, a big thing for us is kind of getting out of our comfort zone in that sense. And if we do need money um, as we're pitching right now, we kind of have to, we have to make it bigger than it might be in our eyes and, and in somebody else's eyes, it might be bigger than what, what we're thinking. Um, but we're very just like at the ground level type of people. So to say like, you know, our thing is going to change the world. We, we know it's not going to change the world. It might change your beard, but it's not going to change. It's not going to change the world. So we're, that, that's like the toughest thing talking to VCs and, and different people like that in that space that kind of want you to just, just add as much fluff as possible. Even if like you have the, the greatest product in the world, like make it even better. Um, so I think that's a, that's a hurdle we're trying to figure out right now as well. And we've talked to, so we're in this pitch competition right now uh, called the crisis challenge. And we've, you know, been dealing with the, the person who created it like week after week, just kind of focusing on like what we're doing. And she just wants to hear our feedback on different things. Um, and these past like two weeks, she's just been um, making sure that our pitch is better than like how we would have had it. So like yeah. adding different things that we're like, we don't really want to add that because it's not, true but she's like don't worry about that like it's just a little bit of fluff to add that so i would say that's the that's the biggest thing that that we we don't even like that but we kind of have to just do it if we want to actually win some money raise some money anything like that yeah and by fluff is it more of that thing of uh like the bigger picture sort of the vision you have to convey to people even though it's super specific and niche now which is the always the goal with anything venture starting up right. Yeah, I would say it's more like, yeah, they want to see how you're going to get to a billion dollars. Yeah. And like, and me and my partner's mind, it's like, we're not even thinking to get to a, a billion dollars. If we get to a million, we're going to be happy in the next year. If we get to 10 million, 20 million, that'll be great. And then eventually we want to actually exit and sell this to a, a Procter & Gamble or a Unilever or something like that. But they want to see that. How are you getting to a billion? How are you going to take over the world? Like, we're not doing that. This is, this is yeah. beard products we're talking about right now. It's not going to, not going to happen. Like, even Dollar Shave Club that sold it for a billion, they're not taking over the world. They're, they're still selling razors. So it, it's kind of that like happy medium that we have to find with, within ourselves um, to, to raise money and, and, and get money that way. I see. Because most people, they go the other way where they're too caught up in the vision instead of boots on the ground, specific niche. Yeah. Go back down the mountain and start over. 
So it's interesting to see, like, you know where you're at and people are trying to influence you and persuade you to change things, even though it's not true to you. Right. Yeah. I would say like, we're, yeah, we're exactly the opposite. Like we don't get caught up in the vision. It's like, we're more like, this is where we're at today. Let's get better for tomorrow. Not let's get better for the next hundred years of what, what it could be. Um, it's, it's like, let's get better for the future, but who knows what's going to happen in, in five, 10 years. Yeah. Which is part of your, when you talked about the upbringing and like how you got into this entrepreneurship space, sales is so ingrained in you that that, is a reason as to why you got to operate like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and him and his dad and my dad are very similar. His dad came like from Greece with like $5 in his pocket. Um, yeah. And like he's built, you know, many, he has a real estate business that he does like phenomenal with. Um, so he's the same way. It's like, don't, there's no fluff. It's just like, this is what it is. This is what it is. Like, don't try and tell me something. It's this when I, I could see it right now. So like, I think that's why we're so like, ingrained that's ingrained in us because both of our parents and um our grandparents are the same way yeah that makes a lot of sense and then well usually i like to always ask like the and you, you don't have to keep it to new men but i was going to ask you for like what are some of the bigger aspirations you have because you're learning the day-to-day you're figuring it out as you go uh, learn a lot from parents and family and grandparents but where do you want to or who is the person you want to become because i don't want to say where do you want to go it's like who do you want to become because then you'll go to that that spot and that place yeah i mean i would my biggest aspiration is to you know go back to my dad's business uh, my family business and take that to like from where it is now which is like it's a 70 million dollar business to a hundred to billion dollar business um like we want, I want to take it to that next level of kind of, he took it from my grandfather, which was probably like a $5 million business and he grew it to something incredible. And I want to take it to that next step. That's kind of like where I would like to be in no, no period of time. Cause my dad's going to probably work until the day he dies. Um, <laughs> so like I have no, there's no timeline with that, but I want to get to that point uh, eventually. And so your great, your grandpa had the, it was meat and cheese distribution, but how did your dad expand it yeah so my dad now my dad and my uncle in 2007 uh got a call from the u.s open um because they had heard that they did some minor catering gigs um like around the local area and they did it very well so my grandfather was strictly get this deli meats send it to the customer don't slice it don't do anything my dad and my uncle took a couple gigs They're like, Oh, let's make some sandwiches. Let's make some wraps. Let's make some salads, different things like that. And it went well enough that they did it for somebody who had a connection with the, like the tennis us open, um, in New York. And they called them and they said, Hey, can you handle this? Of course, you're just going to say yes. Cause it was a very big sale. So they said, yeah, we can handle it. And in 2007, I was eight years old. I think I, that's when I started making sandwiches. Like literally I was on, on a production line. Like we're, we're making sandwiches right then and there. Um, so that's how that, portion of the business started and now my grandfather's side of it like the meat and cheese distribution probably makes up only 10 percent of our revenue and the 90 percent of it is all from this grab and go sandwiches uh wraps and all that grab and go type of catering stuff um so now we cater to any colleges any hospitals any stadiums all from boston down to north carolina wow Um, yeah it's you never know who's watching but also the mantra you said before it's like no one's going to do it for you. So the fact that they did that and then that came from it is super fascinating. Yeah. So now like it's even, it's growing even more now that with, with COVID happening, it took a a big hit just because colleges closed uh, campuses and stuff like that, but they're slowly pivoting into different, you know, mediums to actually get the product in. So now we've just been introduced into all the shop rights in the area. Um, We're going to get into different supermarkets in like the Boston area, we've now opened up a new warehouse in and production facility in Cincinnati. Um, so we're kind of growing in, in that sense, even though we've been restricted with COVID and stuff like that, you still have to figure out a way to, to keep growing. Exactly. Exactly. You got to innovate. Well, for one, uh, dream big, we helped this one client it's restaurant based, uh, food and beverage. Mm-hmm. They just had a restaurant in Delhi, but the restaurant, cause you can't do indoor, indoor dining. Right. Um, 
it was for the most part now it's 25 percent capacity mm-hmm. they uh saw that they were going to lose a lot of revenue and not make a lot of money on that side so they ended up opening a cafe and reducing the size of the restaurant so it's restaurant cafe deli now mm-hmm. um and that's just like the food space you're seeing that change and then there was also another uh nonprofit within philadelphia that uh was based at drexel and okay. they were at the entrepreneurship school and they have actually it's, it's called sharing excess and okay. they share excess food within the local community so for them it was actually the opposite where covid came and their business grew so much yeah. because so many people needed excess food so it's fascinating to see, especially within this space, all of that changing. And then the emergence of cloud kitchens and this one startup, Truck Bucks, you know, mm-hmm. trucks are going to take over that I know of. Sure. So it's, it's nice to know someone who has like a, a big pillar in that space. And I think that would be another good connection with sharing excess. Absolutely. Um, I don't know how much food you guys waste within your... Uh, probably a good amount. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It depends. Yeah, it depends on what we're making. But yeah, I yeah. definitely can connect with them. Yeah, but that's cool because you got you're at the sp- spot now with new men to where you have to learn this uh, sort of next phase to level up, and then you can apply that learning to when you go to the family business and and use that to scale even more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like with with my family business, it's very like no technology, no like our <laughs> website's not the best. Like it's it's everything is very uh, just grassroots type of thing. So that side of it once i learned this d to c which i mean I, I have been learning but how to scale it um in that sense then i think we'll be able to actually like grow and, and that's just a completely different space that we've never even touched before um so that's definitely a different side of it yeah that that's true italian like all word of <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's literally just my literally my uncle just knocking on everybody's door and, and seeing who needs what and then my dad handles all the operations with that yeah Wow, good stuff. That's solid. Yeah. I uh, I definitely filled up my cup of questions, but I would love to sort of leave like a last thirty seconds to a minute if you want to bring up anything, any other new learnings this year, or any uh, uh like I always like to leave the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, new learnings this year. I would say definitely with COVID and everything happening, uh, it's definitely taught us how to pivot. So I would say to anybody you know, trying to start something new, even in these times right now or then down the road, don't be afraid to change what you're doing to, you know, adapt. Don't be discouraged if something happens that makes you have to rethink some things. Keep plowing forward if you know it's working and, and just keep hustling at it. Yeah. That's odd. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, brother. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. We'll keep in touch. Absolutely.